We'll now uh, kick off into the, uh, the afternoon session uh, with Cathy Sudlow uh, just giving an introduction to the uh, health outcome follow-up. Cathy. Thanks very much, Rory. Uh, lovely to be able to uh, follow Francis Collins. So, um, UK Biobank is uh, particularly important because it's a prospective study. And being a prospective study means that scientists can relate uh, a whole range of different risk factors and exposures gathered from the participants when they first attended or shortly thereafter to their subsequent health and disease. And every participant in this regard, unfortunately, will be informative because everybody is going to, at some stage, get sick for one reason or another. All of us will die at some point. All of that information about participants um, as they go through life is going to be prospectively available to researchers, provided we get the job of follow-up correct. And boy, do we have a challenge. So here are just some of the incident, that is, outcomes occurring after the point of recruitment that we have projected through models will be occurring and will occur amongst the half million participants in UK Biobank during the course of their follow-up. So by 2012 already we estimated that there were several thousands of people who would have developed new onset of diabetes, new heart attacks, new strokes, and so on. And th this is just a smattering of some of the more common outcomes. There are very many more, and of course all of those are of interest to a participant or a bunch of researchers um, everywhere. And as, as we go through time, the numbers of people who will be developing disease get larger and larger. This is the power of Biobank, but it's also a challenge for us because we need to find these people um, as they develop these diseases so that their outcomes can be informative for research studies about the causes of disease and the determinants of who develops disease and who doesn't um, of any particular type. And our challenge is increased by the fact that the participants have been recruited from all over the UK. That was the strategy to enable recruitment of such a large and diverse cohort. It's also a challenge because there are participants in Scotland, England and in Wales recruited from these different centres. They've all moved around a little um, and we are able to keep up, at least to some extent, um, with their movements. But this is an important part of the challenge. So these individuals can't be followed up by nurses or doctors face to face. That would be simply impractical. And we need clever and scalable means of finding out what happens to them. So how does one follow up half a million people? Um, well, we need methods that are comprehensive. We want to follow all of them up, not just some of them, all of them. We need methods that are scalable, and we need methods that are cost-effective. Um, and because all of the participants were, at the time of their recruitment, registered with our UK National Health Service, and because they all consented to linkage during the course of follow-up in perpetuity to health-related records, we have an opportunity. The NHS still provides the majority of healthcare in the UK. Long may it remain so. Um, and those of you who live in England, uh, I live in Scotland, please try to vote to allow um, our UK NHS to remain um, as little fragmented as possible for all sorts of reasons. Uh, there are national data sets about healthcare and health outcomes. And so by linking to these, we ought to be able to gain efficiently and cost-effectively a lot of information about what's happening to people um, as we follow them up. So step one of our challenge is to obtain these linked data, to gain access to these national linked data sets. It ought to be very straightforward because there are national resources in Scotland, England, and Wales for linking to these data sets. It turns out that it's a highly challenging, involved exercise with a great deal of regulation and bureaucracy, some of it appropriate, and some of it, uh, quite frankly, not appropriate. But we have managed, and it's been a substantial journey and achievement over the last several years, to achieve linkages to some of these key national level uh, cohort-wide sources to obtain data on all of our participants. So we find out by linking to death registration systems who dies and what they die of. We find out by linkage to cancer registration systems which operate at national level and have done for decades. 
um, who is developing cancer and of what type. Um, and we find out by linkage to hospital episode data sets in all three countries um, who is being admitted to hospital and for what reason. And these data sets are coded according to internationally recognized coding systems so that what we obtain are essentially lots and lots of codes which give us diagnostic information um, and lots and lots of dates for when these events, be they hospital admissions, deaths, or registrations of the occurrence of cancer occurred. And we now have efficient ongoing linkages to these three major sources of outcome information. Now, they're not perfect, and we'll come on to that later, but they are comprehensive, and they provide us with a great deal of information. The holy grail in this uh, linkage to cohort-wide sources of information is to link to primary care data. Um, so we have made some significant achieve achievements in our linkage to primary care data, uh, but it hasn't come very easily. And we've also been exploring uh, the possibilities of and starting to link to a wide range of other data sets as well. And I don't want to dismiss those, but it has always been a mission to really pull off the key cohort-wide linkages that are going to be maximally informative for the widest range of diseases. So what about primary care then? There, there isn't any comprehensive national source for the whole population of electronic coded data in Scotland, in England, or in Wales. Um, if anyone tells you that there is, please tell me who they are. I'd like to talk to them, but I don't believe that there is. But uh, because all biobank participants have consented to linkage to health-related records, and this is the case for some other cohorts, we do have an advantage. Um, and that means by working carefully with partners in Wales and Scotland initially, um, we have managed to cover and link to uh, general practice information for about 17,000 out of 21,000 Welsh participants and about 27,000 out of 36,000 Scottish participants. That's been a long time coming, and we hope that there will be further increases using the systems that we've built up and amended as we've moved forward. There's been a hole in our primary care data linkage until recently, and that's been England, and we've worked with some of the uh, potential national solutions for provision for general practice data, which haven't thus far been able to deliver the cohort-wide coverage we wanted. We've started talking to the computer system suppliers who provide systems to individual general practices, and luckily for us, there are now only three major players in England, and the largest player, the Phoenix Partnership, is now partnering with us to help us gain linkage to general practice data. And I'm very pleased to say that we have either just received or are just about to receive within the next day or so um, data on about 200,000 extra participants uh, linked to uh, their primary care records. So that will give us a whole load more codes, very complex, very messy, and dates to play with to enable us to identify uh, people who are getting a whole range of uh, health issues that are not handled in any sense through hospital admission, but are nonetheless very important for us to understand and very important in terms of the benefit to people and to the public's health. And we hope to increase that uh, coverage by working with the other two major GP system suppliers. So things are really starting to move forward in terms of our health record linkages. So step two, having established these linkages and working towards cohort-wide cover coverage, is to understand these linked data. And that is a, a, a great challenge as well, because we need to use them to accurately identify and then create detailed characterization of a whole range of health-related outcomes. Dealing initially with the common ones that we think many researchers will be interested in and that we think it's right to support research into, but increasingly moving towards less common, more detail um, and rarer conditions um, as resources allow. So it's important for us to understand what these coded data actually tell us. How accurate are they? When somebody's discharged from hospital, a doctor writes a discharge summary, and that eventually wends, it, wends its way down to the basement of the hospital, where not particularly well-paid people code up the discharge summaries and apply these codes that we then obtain through our national-level linkages. 
So they're not perfect, they're subject to the interpretation by trained people who actually, it turns out, do a fantastic job most of the time, uh, but we don't get 100% accuracy. And the question is, where and when does that matter? And how detailed are these codes? How much depth do they go into? And how complete are they for any particular disorder which we're obtaining access to th from any particular source? Some of these questions have been addressed, um, and there are many people in this room, no doubt, who work with linked health record data who, who will be working with us either now or in the future to help address these questions. But there isn't a comprehensive idea across all disorders um, of the answer to these questions. What's the optimum combina combination of sources for any particular condition of interest? Again, that's something we're starting to grapple with. And when and how do we need to go beyond the coded data? When are these codes not enough? When do we need access to the free text, unstructured information within individuals' electronic medical records or even paper medical records or access to their tissue, as we were talking about earlier, to really get to grips with the disease subclass that they have and the particular factors that might help us to explain why that's developed in that individual. So we have a, a whole program of work around outcomes adjudication and we've assembled teams of individuals to help give us advice around how we should approach this and how we should use these linked record data sets and when we need to go beyond them for a whole range of different disorders and that you can see on this slide here. Um, and it's a massive piece of work that we'll be continuing over the next several years, trying to deliver uh, for researchers derived data fields, a little bit like those imaging derived phenotypes or the phenotypes that we saw emerging from the accelerometry data this morning to make sense of this massive amount of linked record data and to convert it into disease outcomes that can be used in research studies. So we have a staged approach to outcomes adjudication where we look at the ascertainment of suspected cases of disease using relatively inexpensive sources of linked data that I've alluded to. And then look at confirming disease by looking at uh, the overlap between those sets of data and by creating algorithm algorithmic combinations of these electronic coded records, perhaps by uh, reference to disease registers as well in some circumstances. And then moving beyond that, there's an ambition to look at the subclassification and more detailed adjudication of cases, which inevitably will be more involved and costly and can't be applied to the whole cohort. But one might do that by linking into the detail of the written electronic record for particular individuals or by referring to specialised databases such as imaging that occurs in clinical practice, or by collecting uh, samples of tumour tissue for individuals who've developed cancer. So moving from linked data to research outcomes is a phased process. It can't all be done in one go. For each disorder, it involves some scoping, some reviews of the literature to work out what is already known and what isn't known. It involves working with those key data sets around deaths, cancers and hospital episodes, working out how to combine them to maximise the ability to identify with high fidelity people who have developed particular diseases to act as cases in case control comparison studies. It involves then adding in the additional data that we're starting to pull into the resource from primary care um, to generate more complex algorithms that allow the incorporation of that additional information as well. And then it involves thinking about, for each disorder, what role there will be for a further deep dive expert adjudication, which might be done by human experts, or in the future by machines which can learn to act like human experts to give us the detail that is hidden behind those codes in the written uh, medical record, in the results of investigations, in the images, and so on. And just briefly, uh, complementing that is our web questionnaire program. So as you've heard earlier, we have an email address for an excess of 300,000 um, of the half million biobank participants, which allows us to get in touch with them relatively quickly and cost effectively. And every time we do that and invite them through email to take part in a questionnaire or survey, about a third or more of them very quickly respond, complete the survey and provide information. So it's a highly cost-effective and rapid means of obtaining information from a large subset of the cohort. And for each of these exercises, that's returned information quickly on somewhere between 100 and 200,000 individuals. 
it has therefore great potential to complement the more passive, from a participant perspective, data linkage effort uh, to follow up through data linkage to obtain information that we can't get hold of through health-related records. And it's been used successfully, as you've heard, to collect data on diet, cognition, and occupation, and will be used in the very near and further future, and you'll hear more about this later, um, to give us information on people's mental health status, um, a repeat of their cognition um, and follow-ups thereafter, information on pain, quality of life, and other aspects of health that are not readily obtained from linked healthcare data. So I'm going to hand over now to several colleagues who are going to give you some context uh, to hang those general uh, introductory comments around and to tell you about some of the work that's going on around follow-up for mental health disorders, where we'll be hearing from Matthew Hotop. Uh, dementia, where we'll be hearing from Tim Wilkinson, a research fellow, and uh, on cancer, when we'll be hearing from Naomi Allen. And then we'll have a panel discussion chaired by John Danesh. Thanks very much.